Now, I want to do one more thing, one more time, and I hate the fact that I have to do this, but I've answered a lot of confusing questions since this morning. And so I remind myself, my brother and I kind of tease each other at times like this when we don't communicate well and we remind each other, hey, we communicate for a living. And so every now and then, those who are communicators, they don't quite do it that well. So let me tell you one last time, I hope. I have some form of severe injury to my shoulder, okay? And I have been given a very difficult sentence by my first doctor in how to repair it if it's even repairable in his mind. So Lori and I did not accept that, and so we continued to look and search, and friends led us to a second opinion, which is in the long and the short of this story, going to give me a little hope, I hope, okay? Here's what the doctor said. He said, let's throw a Hail Mary at this. I said, okay. And I reminded myself then, keep your eye on this doctor while we talk, because I was always told that if you were in the midst of a storm on a boat, look at the face of the captain, look into his eyes and listen to his voice, and that way you'll know whether you need to be scared or not. And so as I looked in his face and I heard all of the things he had to say to me and Lori, he had enough confidence, he gave us enough hope, and he said, I have done worse, I've helped people with worse problems, and he said, if it doesn't work, at least we didn't burn any bridges, we'll go at it again somehow. I'm like, I'm in, whatever will give me hope. So that's what's happening to me, and that's going to be on Wednesday, April the 7th. And that's what I meant when I said, after that, you may not see my face as much, you may not hear my voice as much for a little while, and that's when I gave you that one good word. And that word is in the house tonight, Brother Herman Parker. He's going to spend a couple of Sundays with us, and we'll figure out some of the rest. And I'll be behind the scenes. Luckily, I don't have to work hard for a living, and so I'll be able to do all the things that I can do, but it may just take me just a little bit of time. So I hope that clears it up, and I hope I don't have to address that again because I don't want to keep talking about that. But hey, I want to introduce y'all to a new friend of mine. Javaris, would you come up here? Javaris? Yeah, you. You know who you are. Javaris, you come on up here. I think y'all might know Javaris, okay? <laughs> what joke? Look, all I know is I have a tech. I'm going to stand up on this. I'm ready. I'm no, ready you stand it. down there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stand up here so I can Night. be taller. This is my new text friend named Javaris. Hey, everybody. Y'all know Javaris? Y'all might know him as Jonathan Williams, okay? But he texted me one day messing with me and wanting to know about our church. And he said, my name's Javaris. I'm like, all right, Javaris, let's go. And so we just got to going. But hey, I, you know, I, I know he, you have roots here in Eufaula, right? And y'all have roots with him. I have heard oh, no. that we need to have you and Brad Stevens sing a duet. Is that true? Yeah. And that's what I've heard. And Wayne. Uh, and, Wayne. and Wayne. Okay. Now, now I, I also heard that you are the lead singer. Oh, no. I get that. Isn't that what you said, Stephen? Yeah. He is the lead singer. And so, no, listen, Jonathan and I have kind of gotten to know each other through Facebook and through Messenger. He's always very kind to me. He keeps up with everything that goes on here. And he is the minister of outreach at a 3,000-member church in Montgomery, Alabama, the uh, Frazier. And Jonathan's worshiping with us tonight. And so I'm going to, I told him, I said, I'm about to look like Randy Giddings, not the head, but the arm. Um, and I said, one of these days, I'm going to travel up to Montgomery, and I want to sit down and learn from you in this area of outreach. And so uh, I just want to poke some fun and have some hey, fun. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for texting me back. Yeah, you're right. So I just want to make sure y'all knew, knew who Javaris was. And so uh, thank y'all for that very much. Hey, uh, let's get to what we came to, uh, for tonight. We're going to come back in, uh, to this series of messages that we've been in for a few weeks uh, that I have uh, given the title to of Famous Last Words. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get you an outline tonight. There's not going to be as much of one of those outlines tonight uh, that you're used to seeing anyway. But uh, if I need to, I'll give you one later and go back to this. Because we've covered five of the seven last sayings of Jesus. And we have two more to go. 
And so tonight we're going to come to number six. Next week, which is Easter Sunday morning, we are going to do number seven. But tonight we're going to come to this one that is called It Is Finished. And if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open it back to where we were this morning in John's Gospel chapter 19. We'll come to that in just a moment. I want you to keep your Bible open because we'll come back to it as well here in a second. But I want to ask you something the, just to kind of get us started in thinking about uh, this word, it is finished, and it's really the gift of victory. The gift that Jesus is giving us in this, I've, I've tried to label each one as a gift. Uh, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing, he is giving us the gift of forgiveness. Then to the criminal on the side of him, the evildoer that confessed his faith in Jesus, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so that's the gift of assurance. And then Jesus gives us this wonderful gift that I've called affection or love. Either one is, uh, will work there. As he looked at his mother, Mary, and said, Behold your son, as he nodded or motioned to in some way to John. And then he looked at John and said, Behold your mother. In other words, Mom... John's going to take care of you from this point forward. And as I said this morning, John, you know what to do. And he did. And so a great gift of affection and love and assurance and forgiveness. And then we talked about this gift of anguish. That in the midst of this three hours worth of darkness, Jesus cried out in anguish. And in some of the worst uh, imaginable emotion, pain, not just physical pain, but the pain of separation from the Father when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason why that is an incredible gift is because he, as he's cried out in anguish in that way, that means we do not have to cry out in that anguish for eternity if we would but accept Jesus as our Savior. This morning we talked about the gift of humanity where Jesus simply declared from the cross, I am thirsty. And again, in that, as we talked about this morning, in every conceivable way, Jesus knows exactly where you are in life. He knows exactly what you're going through. He has felt the pain. He has experienced the emotion. He knows everything there is. And I ask you the question, what other God, as if there is another God... But what other God has done that for those that are called his subjects? There are none. And so tonight we come to this word called, it is finished. And the, again, the gift for us tonight is victory. But let me ask you this when it comes to everyday life. Is, have any of you ever said something like, I just don't feel like I have enough time to get everything done? Anybody there? Okay, I'm the number one guy that does the same thing. I just can't seem to get it all done. Now, I've been told by people a whole lot smarter than me uh, that if that's the case, Mike, you are trying to do too much. If you every day or every week at the end of the day or at the end of the week go back and do an inventory of that time and you say, wow, I just didn't seem to get it all done. I had multiple projects that I wanted to get started. Some projects that I got started only got halfway through. Some of the dreams of what I wanted to do just didn't seem to materialize. And unfinished business abounds. I've been told, well, then you're trying to do too much. This is obviously a problem that Jesus did not have. Jesus finished all of his business. Now, if you have your Bibles open to John chapter 19, we're going to begin reading in verse 28. So it's going to be a little bit of a review of what we read this morning, but we're going to read through verse number 30, and this is what it reads. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Now, Jesus' journey, Jesus' purpose in life had begun approximately 33 years prior to this moment in a simple little uh, stable. And at this moment, from that point till now, and we know Jesus' purpose began way before the beginning of time, but as a man, for these 33 years, at this moment, Jesus was able to declare these words because his task was done. It was completed. I think of the disciples that had left to go get food for Jesus in John chapter 4 while he was there visiting with a Samaritan woman at the well. And when they came back, they saw an energy in him that made them think, well, where did he get food? Where did he get nourishment? To which Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me and to finish his work. I love the word tenacity. I love a tenacious individual. That is a person who is resolute. That is a person who is focused. That is a person who does not let other things get in their way once they know exactly what their purpose is and what their goal is, and they work toward it. It happens to be one of the traits of my daughter. I've always looked at my daughter and I've known that she is a very tenacious individual. And once she is on that path, she is unmoved. And if you know what I'm talking about, or if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask Lori. She can tell you. Tenacious. And that's the way Jesus was. He was a man of purpose, fully man as we talked about. And he said, I have come to do the work of my Father who sent me and to finish his work. What actually was finished at this point? When Jesus says... It is finished. What was the mission that was now finished as he uttered these words? Let me give you a couple of examples. In Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He had completed his task. In Luke chapter 4, Verses 18 and 19, Jesus gives us multiple versions of the same purpose that was his. Number one, he says, I have come to preach the good news to the poor. He said, I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. He said, my purpose is to come and give recovery of sight to the blind and to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, he gives us more of his purpose that was finished when he tells us that the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, he says, have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Upon his arrest in John chapter 18 and verse 37 to Pilate, he simply said, I have come to testify to the truth. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist spoke of the purpose of Jesus that he came to fulfill where he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus again spoke of himself in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 where he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul to the uh, young Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says to him, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. John in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5 says to us that he appeared to take away our sins. In a nutshell, you have heard in those random survey of verses the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ that he had come to do. Now, Jesus often spoke of the work he had to do in the two metaphors of the cup and the baptism that were his to drink of fully and to be fully immersed in in baptism as the will of the Father. And at this moment, Jesus knew that he had, uh, that the cup had been drunk and that the baptism was now complete. 
And so he declared again, it is finished. I want you to look at those verses once again because there's one singular idea found in these verses that's represented in three different words that are all derived from the same Greek root word telos. Look at verse 28 where it says later, knowing that all was now completed. There is your first word, completed. And it goes on and it says, and so that the scripture would be, and here it is, fulfilled. And then the third word comes in verse number 30, where again, after he finished the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. All three of these words, completed, fulfilled, and finished, all come from the same word, and it all again puts together this singular idea of completing an activity, completing the process, bringing it to closure, bringing it to an end, And in regards to time, it describes something that has come to an end. It is now over. And because of the the tense of the verb here, it not only describes a past action that is complete, but the effect of this verb is that it will continue to be made complete. It has been done, Jesus says, and it still will be done. To tell a stop is the word, to telestai. It's used in many different ways. A servant to his master would come to him and declare, to telestai. In other words, I have fulfilled the task before me. The judge, when looking at a case or looking at an individual, would declare, to telestai saying to that individual and to those listening that justice has been served and the sentence has been completed. The accountant or the store merchant would declare to telestai when describing an account and a debt that had been paid in full. The artist would declare to telestai as he or she would put that final stroke of the brush on that painting, saying, in essence, the painting is now complete as they step back from the portrait. The priest would declare to Telesta when saying that the offering has now been given. This is the word of our Lord, to Telesta. It is finished. It is done. It is complete. I have stayed the course. I have fulfilled my purpose. It is done. Now here's the irony of Jesus speaking these words at that moment. And the irony is this. No one there, I believe, understood what he meant. No one present that day, like we do today, no one understood what Jesus was saying. Let's take the Romans for example. They heard Jesus declare to Telestai, it is finished, and they probably thought, well, you're right. We are done with yet another troublemaker. To Pilate, when he heard this word, to Telestai, where Jesus declared, it is finished, Pilate thought, well, yes, it is finished, and now hopefully my political headaches are gone. The Pharisees, for example. The Pharisees heard Jesus declare, to Telestai, it is finished. And I'm sure the Pharisees at that time said to themselves, yes, our competition has now been eliminated to his disciples who were not even there but got the word that to telestai it is finished I'm sure at that moment they thought to themselves that our dream of a new kingdom has vanished no one understood him that day as Jesus declared as 
the darkness began to lift. As he declared to Telestai, everyone scratched their head wondering, what is it that Jesus meant? We know today that these word, this word to Telestai was not a cry of defeat. We know that this word to Telestai was not a cry of agony at all. It was not a cry of pain. It was not a cry of emotional distress. It was not a cry of any of those things. Jesus was not crying defeat. This was indeed a cry of victory. And so as Jesus on that cross declared to Telestai, he was declaring and claiming victory at that moment like it had never been uh, claimed before. And that is our gift from him in, these, in this word. And that is our victory is found in him. Losers whimper away when they are defeated. Winners declare victory. Many years ago, I was about to say when he was young, but he's still young. My son, he was 25, years ago. I've forgotten exactly what was going on, but my son won. And he decided to declare victory. And so he did so by clenching his fists, and I'm going to try to do this, and he raised his arms above his head and looked to the sky and goes, ha, 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 to which my wife, with me in the room, and my father, my father was here this morning, she looked at me and said, there is still not a humble Fortenberry man alive. <laughs> I grew up in a sports family. My father and his two brothers, all three of them, in different ways, uh, what have you, were all professional athletes when they were young. That gene didn't get passed to me. It kind of skipped a generation. I'm still kind of a little bitter about that, but whatever. But anyway, the winners declare victory. And Jesus that day said, it is finished. The journey that began in a simple stable that culminated in that moment in untold agony on the cross resulted in sin, death, hell, and the grave being fully defeated and forever crushed by our Savior. All the things that God had promised for hundreds of years had been fulfilled. All the demands of God's justice fully satisfied. All the debt that was owed by my sin was paid in full. All the fear of death. Are you with me? All the fear of death was wiped away. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15 says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He is forever defeated. Your fear, my fear of death. He also forever defeated the power of Satan. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 it says this, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Your gift tonight is the gift of victory. To Telestai, it is finished. I want you to pray with me. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a moment, I want to slowly, so that you can pray, call out to you these six gifts from our Lord. 
as we seek to prepare our heart and our mind to partake of the Lord's Supper. What better way would there be to worship Him now but to consider these gifts that He's given in prayer and give Him thanks. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgiveness. Assuredly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise, assurance. The affection and the love of our Lord shown to us as He showed His mother by saying, Behold your son. And to John, Behold your mother. His anguish is a precious gift to you tonight where he declared with the greatest emotion that a person's ever declared a word on planet earth, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you're, you would not have to live in anguish today or for eternity. His humanity Another precious gift to you. For you to know that He understands absolutely everything about your life. Where He simply said, I am thirsty. And ultimately tonight, the gift of victory. Where triumphantly, not arrogantly, but triumphantly, he declared, it is finished. He completed everything for you. Father, you are indeed worthy of all of our worship. Father, you are indeed worthy of our lives. Lord, there's no way we could repay you for what you've done for us. Your kindness is unfathomable. Your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your love. Unsearchable. Lord, how can we really know these things? Lord, it's beyond our human ability to fully grasp your heart tonight. So Lord, we simply say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for filling me with assurance. Thank you, Lord for demonstrating affection and love towards me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the anguish that you went through so that I would not. Thank you for being that substitute for me. Lord, I thank you tonight for your humanity being fully God, yet fully human at the same time, able to understand, sympathize, and suffer along with me in everything that life has to offer. Lord, I thank you tonight for victory. I thank you, Father, for the fact that we've won. That in you, Lord, we have victory. And Lord, we know... And we confess right now that this victory 
has nothing to do with ourselves. You have done it all. You accomplished absolutely everything. And again, Father, that makes you praiseworthy tonight. We love you. And Lord, as we come now to be obedient to your command to remember all that you've done in your broken body and in your shed blood, Lord, I pray tonight that as we partake of these elements to demonstrate our participation in your sufferings through your body and blood. Lord, I pray that we'll reflect on these six gifts tonight, knowing that you're worthy again of all of our worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have in front of you your elements, and there's two different sides to it, and you can begin, and you can open up the side that has your wafer in it. That's where we'll begin. Before we do, I'm going to read to you the words out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as Paul speaks to this time for us tonight where he says this beginning in verse number 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. He says, Do this in remembrance of me. Brother Herman, can I ask you, please, sir, would you pray tonight and just give thanks for the broken body of our Lord tonight? Amen. Isaiah 53, we read these words. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. And cause him 
to suffer. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. You can do the same with your cup as you prepare. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 11 where he says in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask John Wayne, would you mind offering a prayer just to simply say, thank you, Lord, for your shed blood that's covered my sin. quote what John Wayne just said in his prayer, Hebrews 9, 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Aren't you grateful for the shed blood of Jesus? Again, Jesus said, drink, this is my blood, in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to say that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. I got one more question for you tonight in light of what we know. What should you do? What should we do? If we want to live a life in a worthy manner by examining ourselves and proclaiming his death until we come, what should we do with him as our example, let me just give you a brief thought. Number one, I would say to you today, live a life of purpose. Your gifts, your talents, your passions, your time. Jesus was focused on his purpose and nothing got him off track. Live a life of purpose. Live a life of focus. Live a life of disciplined priorities. I was always told years ago that a disciplined life is a successful life. Live a life of purpose and live a life of focus. And then finally, I would say to you, live a life of obedience. If our Lord Jesus Christ can humble himself as God of all creation, and become obedient to death, even death on a cross, according to Paul, then surely I can live a life of obedience to his word. Are you willing to live this kind of life? A life of purpose, a life of focus, a life of obedience. Isn't God good?
Aren't his gifts wonderful? To be forgiven, to be given assurance, to be shown affection and love, to be, have his humanity revealed to us, to know that he paid an enormous price as the substitute where I should have been so that we can be victorious. And I cannot wait till next week. I want Sunday to get here immediately where we talk about these words. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And I want to ask you to do something for me. I want to ask you to help me create a nightmare for Stephen Parker. I want you... <laughs> I want you to invite so many people next week that he scratches his head and doesn't know what to do with them. I want it to be such a dilemma that he skips right over me and goes straight to God and says, God, what do I do about this? Would you help me in that? Let's pray and then Luis is going to close us out on the piano. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I thank you, Lord, that we can even smile tonight and even laugh a little. But Lord, more than anything, I thank you for just what the cross meant to us. And I'm thankful tonight, Lord, that ultimately, as we've looked at all these gifts, that we can claim victory because of all that you have done. We praise you. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.